I'm also a biologist in addition to being a doctor, and I like to view psychiatric diseases as a biological phenomenon. And you can look at people's height. Many things are distributed as a bell curve, which we call the normal distribution. So most people are in the middle, and they are short people and tall people, but they are not abnormal in any way. They are perfectly normal, apart from if they have a rare disease like producing too much or too little growth hormone, then they are all normal. If we look, look at psychiatry in the same way, then the low ones, those that are low in mood, we call them depressed, and the tall ones are the maniac ones, and those who have ADHD. Uh, and, and now we approach these limits from both sides so that those in the middle become fewer and fewer. And I think they're already so few that every one of us could get at least one psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, I have tried this out on seven very successful people and myself. We tried three tests for psychiatric disorders. Two of us came out with a diagnosis of depression. Four had definite, likely or possible ADHD. And seven out of eight had mania. <laughs> and uh, one was advised to see a psychiatrist immediately. Uh, she is a very successful science writer. So I have also tried the ADHD test on other people, including in my own family. And uh, if people are very energetic and successful, they are already on their way to getting a diagnosis of adult ADHD if you look at what the criteria are. It's really insane what a uh, diagnosis has developed into in psychiatry. I will now turn into depression because most drugs are antidepressant drugs. They are used the most. And how do we diagnose depression? That's also depressing. Uh, the cent US Centers for Disease Control published in 2010 a survey that 9% of all adult Americans that they interviewed uh, fulfilled the criteria for depression. So are we to believe that 10% of all Americans are constantly depressed? And are we to believe that Americans are by and large uh, incredibly insane because some years ago antipsychotics was the most sold drug class in the United States? It even beat its statins. Of course, we don't accept this. The criteria used for the, uh, the survey was that if you had had less pleasure or interest in doing things for just eight days out of 14, and you had one additional symptom, you were depressed, and that symptom could be difficulty falling asleep, it could be eating less, or overeating, which half of the Americans do, Imagine someone whose girlfriend left him. He would feel badly for all 14 day days. He would sleep badly. He couldn't fall asleep and he couldn't eat anything. All right, you are depressed, so here you are. It's absolutely insane what this has developed into. But then look at the effect of antidepressant pills. The FDA did a huge analysis of 100,000 people of which half were depressed. And uh, the numbers from the literature go somewhat like this. For example, if I take the FDA analysis, 40% got better on placebo, 50% on active drug. So there was a difference of 10%. Now, when I debate with psychiatrists and say that antidepressants have poor effect, then some of them will say, well, yes, but then the placebo effect is good, but the fact that 40% become better in a placebo group, that is not a placebo effect. And why not? Because if you had done nothing but just waited for some months, most of these people would also have improved. If we want to study the placebo effect, we need to find randomized trials where one group got placebo, another group got nothing. You cannot blind these trials because half of them get nothing. 
So if you find these trials, they will be biased. We have done that at my center, and uh, we have more than 200 such trials now, and there is a Cochrane review on the placebo effect, and the placebo effect is pretty small, if it exists at all. The effect of giving people a pill with nothing in it is close to none. So just, I just warn you, uh, psychotherapy is not a placebo therapy. It's real therapy. Human interactions matter. That's not placebo, it's real. So, but I, I tell you this because very many people mix these things up. And the psychiatrists r certainly do it. So, uh, this 10% effect, then we can ask, is this a true effect? You must consider that outcomes in depression trials are highly subjective. Do you sleep better and whatever and you make a Hamilton score? So if these trials are not perfectly blinded, we know from psychological research that people like to be kind and say, yes, I'm somewhat better, although they aren't better if they know that they are on active drug. And these trials have not been effectively blinded. You get dry mouth, maybe blurred vision, your sex life is ruined and lots of other things. You know you're on active drug or on placebo. The same senior researcher who did the placebo review then collected all trials in the world literature that had both a blinded and a non-blinded observer. And why? He wanted to see how much the non-blinded observer exaggerates the measurement of the effect. There were only 21 such trials in the whole world literature. What he found was that the non-blinded observer exaggerated the effect by 36% on average, measured as such ratio. That's very much. If I now assume that everybody have broken the blinding in the depression trials corresponding to a non-blinded observer, then the effect of 10% is gone. There is nothing left. But we don't need to assume that the blinding is broken for all patients, just a minor part of them. If the blinding is broken for just 5% of the patients, and this leads to misclassification of the outcome, then you have an effect of 50% that goes down to 45. And in the placebo effect, the effect goes from 40 up to 45. So there is nothing left if only you break the blinding in a minor portion of the patients. You might think I go too far here, so therefore I will also talk about the wonderful Cochrane review by Joanna Moncrief, who is a psychiatrist in the UK, and colleagues, where they looked for trials with a placebo that had something in it in order to blind the trials better. What this something was, was atropine because it gives people dry mouth and all many other things. So uh, placebo controlled trials that had atropine in the placebo, they found an effect that I recalculated as a Hamilton score of one. And Hamilton goes up to 52. So one is nothing. Stefan Leucht and others have shown what is the the minimum uh, clinical difference on the Hamilton score that people can perceive, this is five to six. So one is nothing. It's below the minimally relevant clinical difference. So put something into the placebo and the effect is gone. And of course, we have no trials with active placebos nowadays. These are mostly from the 60s because the drug companies don't want to put anything into the placebo that gives people side effects because then we could all see that many of these drugs people use in all sorts of, medis of medical areas are completely useless. It would be the emperor's new clothes. You can also ask for a treatment that doesn't cure anybody but may have some symptomatic effect in some patients and also has side effects, isn't the most relevant outcome what the patients think? Do I want to stay on this drug or not when I evaluate the benefits and the harms together? I think it's a very good outcome measure. And guess what? Equally many patients leave the trials on active drug than on placebo. 
So from the patient's perspective, these drugs are pretty useless. Then you can also ask, okay, why do we treat depression? Isn't it to help people get back to work, to save marriages and other intimate relationships, all that sort of thing? Of course it is. There are thousands of placebo-controlled antidepressant trials. I have yet to find a single one that reported these essential outcomes. So either they are very, very rare, or they exist, but they are buried in company archives. We know that quality of life has been studied in many trials. David Healy has seen them uh, in court cases. We have seen them now because we have access to unpublished study reports from the European Medicines Agency. So I have researchers that are working on quality of life right now, and it's the same. It has, it's not the same perhaps, but it has actually been measured in quite many trials, but very rarely reported. And you don't need to be hyper intelligent to find out how that can be. So, so we are looking forward to our results on quality of life on these drugs. I believe it's pretty low because um, half of those who get the drugs uh, have get sexual problems, although they had a normal sex life before they came on the drugs. So it's not particularly likely that these drugs will save intimate relationships when they destroy the sex life in half of those who are treated. These sexual disturbances can be lack of libido, lack of orgasm, lack of ejaculation for the man. That's really a strong pill that can prevent ejaculation because evolution has made it very easy for men to get an... If, if it wasn't the case, some of you wouldn't have been here. One particular side effect is uh, yawning during orgasm. I, I, imag imagine a young person who is put on an antidepressant and yawns during orgasm, or an older person, and let's say it's the man who yawns, and maybe the women will think, why are you yawning? I don't know, he says. Uh, uh, and then next time they have sex, he yawns again. So what is wrong, aren't you? Didn't you sleep well last? Oh yeah, I slept well last night. Why are you yawning? I don't know, he says. And uh, what about the other women you have known? Did you yawn then? No, I didn't, he said. Okay, so, so you don't love me. Uh, you, you can imagine, you don't need to be a stand-up comedian to realize what, what this can lead into. And, and people don't know it can be the drugs. This is one of the worst thing of all the pills people eat that very often they don't think it can be the drug. That is the most terrible thing. Okay, so I have some difficulty believing that these drugs work. In fact, I, be, I think they don't work. I think they don't have an effect on depression. And then, of course, some people will feel they help them enormously, but and psychiatrists, they say, in my clinical experience, antidepressants are wonderful because so many people improve. So they forget about what is the spontaneous course of a depression, it disappears. They forget about that. The pills get all the credit. And the patients think likewise. And of course, these are stimulants. There might be some people who feel it helps them to get a stimulant. But since the average effect is likely none, then they should harm a similar amount of people, in my opinion. So on average, they are pretty useless. That's my view of antidepressant drugs. Now, I have not talked about suicide because what we want more than anything else is to prevent people from committing suicide. And what do these pills do? They increase the risk of people committing suicide. This is really insane. I have discussed with a child psychiatrist on national television how dare you use these drugs in children when they double the risk of suicide? And you know what her response was? Oh, uh, well, you, you need to monitor your children very carefully in the beginning. Well, that's a fake fix, a fake solution. You know very well a child can hang itself while parents see television. Anything can happen. It's horrible. These drugs should be forbidden to children and adolescents. It's so horrible. 
And, and also, it's even harder to find a beneficial effect in children of these drugs than it is in adults. Not a single one of these drugs are approved in Australia for children, not even fluoxetin, I've been told. It should be like that in the whole world. The FDA did a big analysis on suicide that built on 100,000 people. And it looked like uh, the risk of suicidal behavior increased up till the age 40. But when the FDA published their data, it was only till age 25. You should not believe any of this. A person can commit both suicide and homicide at any age. There is no upper age limit. And it's far worse than what the FDA found. The FDA had been cheated by these big drug companies earlier. David Healy has shown in the British Medical Journal how uh, a suicide that happened even before people were randomized was added to the placebo group with the kind of argument, well, they didn't receive any drug. And if it happened after the patients came off an active drug, after the randomization was over, if a suicide happened there, okay, we add it to the placebo group. Both GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, and Eli Lilly did that. In my opinion, this is fraud. Um, so, uh, the, the FDA knew that we cannot trust the drug companies. And what did they do? They told the drug companies to go back in their archives and search for suicides and suicide attempts and suicidal behavior and ideation. And then they were told, we won't check you. That's like if the police tells a criminal, go back to the scene of the crime and see what you find and report it to us and we won't check you. This is absurd that healthcare is like that and that our drug regulators don't protect the public but the drug industry. So, uh, of course, there were far too few suicides when you ask companies like that. And I have found data of clinical trials that were entered in FDA's huge meta-analysis where there were, were far more suicides than in the whole of the FDA analysis. I have three minor materials where there were consistently around 15 suicides per 10,000 people on active drug. And you know what? In the FDA analysis, there was one and not 15. So as far as I can gather, there should have been 15 times more suicides in FDA's analysis. It may be an overestimation, but many, many, many more suicides there should have been in the FDA's analysis. Also because people pay no attention to uh, mutations in cytochrome P420, which is the enzyme in the liver that metabolizes a lot of drugs. But a forensic psychiatrist in Australia has published a series of cases with an enzyme deficiency that uh, gave them a totally wrong plasma level of antidepressant drugs, and where these people had either committed murder or almost committed murder and were put on treatment for totally non-existing reasons like having marital problems, uh, a sister came into a car crash or whatever usual life problems. So these people should never have been treated and they ended up killing someone or almost killed someone because of an enzyme deficiency. People pay no attention to issues like this. Then a little about another bias than the, the unblinding bias. Almost all trials in psychiatry are biased by design. And, you know, and the reason is that you usually take people who are already in treatment with a drug. And then you have a washout period of, for example, one week, and then you randomize them. What happens in the placebo group? You introduce harm in the placebo group because people become abstinent because they, they no longer get a drug. These withdrawal symptoms do not necessarily come in the first week. For example, fluoxetin has a metabolite with a half-life of one to two weeks. They can come after two weeks or three weeks. So then you have a series of trials where you introduce harm in the placebo group, and then you conclude, oh, we have a good drug because it's better than when we harm the placebo group. This is what most trials in psychiatry look like. I'm not kidding. That's how they are. 
And then, um, just before the SSRIs came onto the market, the psychiatrists, they introduced new criteria for dependency. I have often wondered how many millions they were paid for being so generous to the drug industry. So now, they say, and the drug industry say, benzodiazepine cause dependency, but SSRIs do not cause dependency. This is utter nonsense. I had a PhD student that found out that 37 of 42 withdrawal symptoms are the same on benzodiazepines as on SSRIs. You can even get convulsions when you stop an SSRI. It's totally wrong to say one drug gives dependence, the other does not. But very convenient for big pharma. Uh, so about half of those who are put on SSRIs, they have difficulty coming off them again, even if you give them to healthy volunteers. And healthy volunteers can also become suicidal or violent on these drugs. It has nothing to do with depression lifts and then you get more energy to go out and kill yourself or someone else. It's an effect of the drugs and we know what it is. It's an extreme restlessness that we call akathisia that predisposes to this. The other big flaw in psychotropic drug trials are the so-called maintenance trials that you have people who have been su successfully treated and then you randomize them to active drug or placebo. And what happens? You cause harm in the placebo group because they become abstinent. And then you conclude, oh, they still need these drugs. And then you can say, we need, you need to be on them forever. I have heard medical students that failed an exam one particular, I remember, she was told by her psychiatrist, now I'll get you an SSRI and you will likely need it for the rest of your life. She just failed an exam. Uh, yeah, it's surreal. Um, and, uh, and then I heard another professor of psychiatry at a big meeting where I lectured and told about abstinence and withdrawal symptoms. And he stood up and said, I don't have any problems with taking people off drugs? Oh, yes. Then afterwards I thought, okay, probably. He does have problems. But when his patients get problems, he interpreted this as the disease has come back and he put them back on the drug. This is a tautology, this is circular reasoning. So he has no problems because he misinterprets the withdrawal symptoms. It's all so terribly sad how do we get out of all this mess? I'm pretty pessimistic. Capitalism and healthcare are the worst bedfellows you can imagine. We, those of us who are doctors or psychologists or therapists, we didn't become that in order to cash a load of money. Most of us became that to help people. And now we get corrupted if we are not very careful because there is a load of money flowing from the drug industry, uh, particularly to doctors. And uh, the rewards we get in our healthcare systems are similar. Now people in England are, uh, get a bonus every time they come up with a diagnosis of dementia, although they can't do anything about it. These anti-dementia drugs likely don't work and they uh, create a lot of harm. These people uh, lose appetite, get tired and all sorts of things. Exactly what you need when you are demented and old, isn't it? And then they might fall and break their hip and then a quarter of them die. So that's also a tragedy that British doctors are now rewarded for coming up with a diagnosis of dementia. So the system is, is totally wrong in all sorts of ways. So what can we do better? First of all, academics should do clinical trials. The industry should have nothing to do with them. They could pay for them, but they should have nothing to do with them. Uh, I, I'm not allowed to evaluate my own car and come to the uh, car inspection on a bicycle with five meters of paper and saying, well, well, I've tested it much more carefully than you would ever have done. Please look at my papers. They would laugh me out. And I couldn't meet, meet in court in the same way with only my own evidence. That's what the drug industry does. And it leads to the loss of an enormous amount of lives. If you look at old people, there is a UK 
cohort study where patients were their own controls. They were more than 65 years of age. That study found that when people get an antidepressant for one year, it kills one out of 28. Three percent are killed. They fall and break their hip. So uh, we kill a lot of our elderly people with antidepressants. We kill, kill a lot of them with antipsychotics. I have calculated that Eli Lilly has killed 200,000 with Cyprexa alone based on a meta-analysis that was carried out in elderly, demented people. And we kill a lot of our children with psychotropic drugs. So is there any hope that we can learn physicians in a completely corrupt system not to more or less do what they are doing today? I think we cannot. And that's why I have argued that our populations would be better off it if all antidepressants, no, if all psychotropic drugs were removed from the market, if they didn't exist. I know that we would miss them in situations, for example, where a person with schizophrenia is terribly ill and agitating and so on. It would be nice to have one of these drugs. But we harm our populations to such an extent that the best thing we could do was to deregister all of them. Just like that. I'm not advocating this. I would hope we could educate our doctors, but what should they come down to? Less than 5% of the current usage, or maybe less than 1%. Very, very few people should get these drugs. And for very short periods of time, and then with a firm plan for tapering them off, also even if it becomes difficult to get people off the drugs. If we can get there, yes, keep them on the market, but if we continue anything like the current system we have, then I can only conclude that the availability of these drugs are immense, is immensely harmful. Thank you.